the sound of his voice the seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my
We're in 1 Samuel chapter 12, just going through the historical books of 1 and 2 Samuel. It'll take us a little while, but we're going to make it through. And as we do, we're observing the history of God's people. Remember, this is a people that God himself, through Abraham, had set apart for himself. Not that he is selfish, but that he is ultimately selfless. In other words, through this people, he would bring about the Messiah, Jesus, who would come some 2,000 years ago in the flesh, live perfectly, die sacrificially, and then rise again miraculously that anyone who believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Like this is still connected to that story. So in 1 Samuel, we come upon a time in Israel's history. I've said it again over and over and over. I'm going to keep saying it over and over and over just so you know probably every week. 1 Samuel happens at a time in Israel's history where there was no king, although that's about to change. There was no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It was a dark time in Israel's history. If you want to know what that looked like, what it felt like, and how it was, I would encourage you to go back and read the book of Judges. Though God is faithful to his people, his people continue to turn away from him in unfaithfulness, find themselves in need of rescuing and salvation, so to speak. And then God graciously hears their prayers, their cries for deliverance, and he provides a judge who would temporarily rescue them out of their rebellion. See, 1 Samuel happens along the, the same historical timeline as that period in Israel's history. And so far, what we've seen is on the outset, the Israel or the leadership in Israel is not good. And so Samuel miraculously comes on the scene. And as he done, he restores a sense of faithfulness to the leadership in Israel. He's not ultimately their leader. The Lord still is, and he is the one who would stand. He, he acts as a judge and prophet. He would stand in between the people and God and God and the people. He would represent God to the people and the people to God. And he would do so faithfully his entire life. Now, at a certain point, Israel, even though God had delivered them from the hands of all of their enemies, even though God had taken care of them, provided for them, and protected them, Israel was always on the verge of panicking. Life is like that sometimes, isn't it? What You're welcome because I edited. What, what went through my mind was life be like that. Huh? And then I, <laughs> I watched a comedian last night who speaks differently than I do, and I was watching this comedian, and I was thinking to myself the whole time, do not repeat those phrases. Do not repeat those phrases. It's not good to watch stand-up comedy on a Saturday night for me. But life be like that sometimes, right? Life is stressful and overwhelming and anxiety-ridden. It can be for many, right? There's lots going on all around us. Well, for Israel, the same thing was going on, and they panic, and in their panic... They go to Samuel and they say, we want a king to rule over us like all the other nations. One who will go out before us in battle and guarantee victory, protect us and provide for us in the midst of all of these enemies around us. The problem with that is God had already been doing that for them. He was supposed to be recognized as their transcendent king. And though he would give them a king later who would do all that he would command, that is not what the people were asking for. They were asking for a king who would be like all the other nations. And this fear, comparison, and then panic leads Israel to some bad places. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, we're going to come along and it's kind of the end of how Saul had become their king. Remember, we looked at this last week. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, Saul is now the king. And we get a picture in chapter 12 of the drama that unfolds with Israel's devotion. And I'll air quote it because I think it's lack of devotion. Israel had a history from the time that God led them out of the wilderness, out of Egypt and through the wilderness, Israel had a history of not being as devoted to God as he was to them. Of not loving him like he loved them. Amen? 
<laughs> hold on to that amen and those phrases because those challenges will be the same for us in a little bit. And so chapter 12 is a, is a snippet or a snapshot of what that drama looks like. And, and as we see it, we're supposed to be encouraged about our lives specifically when we make mistakes. Is there anybody in the room willing to admit that you make mistakes? And I know through the, the American church throughout history has not been so willing to do so. But we should be now. I think all of us agree. Like we go through life and we make mistakes. Some of them are big and some of them are little. <laughs> some of them are big mistakes where we accidentally offend people or we purposely walk away from God. And some of the mistakes are little. Like we order the wrong bunt cake at nothing bunt cakes. Is there any? Just a little pro tip for you. If you have not visited a little local establishment called Nothing Bunt Cakes, your life is less than what it could be. They're delicious. Think healthy Twinkie. Are you with me? It's a healthy Twinkie. And no matter how many people are disagreeing with me right now, it's a healthy Twinkie. It's so good. Well, sometimes our mistakes are meaningless like that, and at other times, they come with great meaning. As we walk through chapter 12, we're going to see and be encouraged about what we can do when we tend to make mistakes, because that's what Israel had done. They made a grave mistake in rejecting God's leadership and accepting one that would come from a mere mortal who we will see in the next few weeks. We will see his downfall is great. In the meantime, we have chapter 12. Look at verse 1. It says, And Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have obeyed your voice in all that you have said to me, and I have made a king over you. And now, behold, verse 2, the king walks before you, and I am old and gray. Samuel's nearing the end of his life. And behold, my sons are with you. We already know from the previous chapters that his, his sons were not walking in his ways, which were the way of faithfulness to God. So... He says, I have walked before you from my youth until this day. In other words, he's saying, you know who I am, and you know what my life has been like. Here I am, verse 3, testify against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken, or whose donkey have I taken, or whom have I defrauded, whom have I oppressed, or from the, whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? Testify against me, and I will restore it to you. Verse 4, and they say, you have not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from any man's hand. And he said to them, the Lord is witness against you and his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they said, he is a witness. Samuel stands up at this moment. Remember, Saul has ascended to the throne and Israel is rejoicing because they're getting exactly what they want. Understand, be sure to, to comprehend that their mistake was thinking that what they wanted was actually what they needed. What they needed was God's continuous rule and reign in their life. And what they wanted was a king that was less than divine to go out and quote unquote win their battles for them. And they had gotten in Saul exactly what they wanted. And so they're rejoicing, and Samuel is trying to work all of this out for their good. Samuel is trying to represent God to them and say, okay, if you're going to rejoice, make sure you understand what you should be rejoicing about. And by the way, since I'm going to stand up and talk to you, you should pay attention to what I have to say. Do you guys see that? He says, you should pay attention to what I have to say. And the reason you should pay attention is because I have been unlike any other leader you've had in your recent history. Have I done anything wrong in your sight? And they all say, no, you haven't. We've watched you from the time you were a little kid living in the temple and we wondered where your mom was. You guys, like the Bible happened in real life. Okay? Just so you know, if there's a little kid running around the church all the time. He was here in the morning when you showed up, in the afternoon when you left, on Monday when you stopped by, on Wednesday when you came for a Bible study or whatever, and that little kid was here, you'd be thinking, okay, 
what is going on. Well, Samuel says, I've been here all along. My life has been lived out publicly before you, and I've defrauded no one. I haven't done what the bad leaders before me did, and I have not done, check out the language, go back and read it. I have not done what this king will do to you. I haven't taken anything from you like the old leaders did and like Saul will. Instead, I have given you everything which is God's word. Now, remember, Israel, at this moment, they have made a mistake by exchanging what they needed for what they wanted. This is a mistake we all make, yes? So it's relevant to us today. And in that place, we have to be careful. We have to understand that sometimes when we've made mistakes, it's God's desire that we would look away from those mistakes and look to good and faithful, godly people that he's placed in our lives. Those who have lived before God with integrity and are willing to speak honestly. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, how many of you know when that moment happens, it can be difficult? First and foremost, as a people, when we make mistakes, we should recognize there should be people within our community. There should be people within our spheres of relationship. There should be people that we can look to. We should have relationships with people who are walking with the Lord with integrity. Those who are not the ones who just don't make mistakes. We're not talking about people who are perfect, but we're talking about people whose lives are perfectly aligned, meaning those who continuously look to the Lord, listen to the Lord, hear from the Lord, worship the Lord, etc., etc., etc. The first thing that needs to happen if we make mistakes, and we will, is we need to look for and then listen to the voice of those that the Lord has placed in our lives who are living for Jesus with integrity. They may have something to say. They may give us reminders. They may give us corrections. They may inspire us. All of which God is using Samuel to do with his people in chapter 12. So the first thing we got to do when we've made mistakes is look for faithful servants. The other side of that coin would be this. We have to ask ourselves a question in this moment on this day. Are we those that others, when they make mistakes, are we those that they could look to? Is what they see in our lives an honest and transparent and genuine representation of our faith? That, I think, is the easier part because I've gotten to know so many of you, and it feels genuine to me. Not perfect, but who among us is besides the Lord? But it feels genuine. Like when I think about the people of Rogue Valley Christian Church and many of the Christians that I come across in this valley, I think about people who genuinely mean well. Yes and amen? The first side, the first part of that is easier than the second part because the second part is this. Are we those who, when someone needs us to help them because they've maybe made a mistake, are we those who are willing to speak boldly, honestly, and even courageously? That can be a little more difficult. I don't know about you, but I don't like disappointing people. It's easier on a Sunday morning with a microphone than it is on a Monday afternoon when we're sitting together in a coffee shop. I don't like telling people what they don't want to hear. I especially don't like correcting you, unless, of course, you're five and running around the house crazy. <laughs> See, Christianity isn't for the faint of heart. We have to remember that. It requires something of us. It requires that when we make a mistake, we look to those who God has placed in our lives, who are willing to walk with us, set an example for us, and then speak to us about what we may or may not do to correct the situation. At the same time, we have to realize that God, part of God's desire for our lives, part of his call is that we would be a people that others could look to. We would be people that others, in the midst of their, 
their tragedies, in the midst of their struggles, in the midst of their failings and their failures, we could be a people that they could look to. Not a people that they're afraid of because they're going to hear that they've blown it one too many times and they out. Not that. Or not a people, on the other hand, who say, oh, it's no big deal. Don't even worry about it. It'll all work out. No, a people that are willing to stand in the middle of messes and represent God to them and them to God. Christianity isn't for the faint of heart. And I suggest to you, Samuel was a strong and courageous leader. He was a strong and courageous presence in the midst of his community. Are you? Am I? We're meant to be. Well, we go on, and here's what happens, verse 6. So Samuel says, hey, you should listen to me. Then he goes on, and he says, you should listen to me, because I've been honest before you as it relates to what God wants from you and who he is, and don't forget about what he has done, and he deserves better than the devotion that you've been giving him. He says, verse 6, and Samuel said to the people, the Lord is witness who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. First, he says, hey, look, you should pay attention to the Lord. Don't forget about what he's done for you. And because of what he's done for you, he deserves better than this half-hearted devotion that is constantly cheating on him. So he goes on. He, rose, he, ra he raised up Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers up out of Egypt. Now, therefore, verse 7, stand still that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous deeds of the Lord that he performed for you and for your fathers. Well, see, what? there's something, I know it's hard to get it, but when we read things like that, we have to understand that the writer is writing theologically. It's important that Samuel isn't just saying, hey, don't forget what God did for you. His desire to stand before the Lord and recount before the people God's faithfulness to them was so that the people and God both would remember his faithful covenant to them. So that they would remember, wait a minute, this is who God is. He does not give up on us. We'll get to that in a moment. So he goes on in verse 8 and he says, When Jacob went into Egypt and the Egyptians, the Egyptians oppressed him, them, then your fathers cried out from the Lord, out to the Lord, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God, and, they sold, and he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hatzor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. God has been faithful to you, even though you haven't been faithful to him, uh, Samuel is saying. And when they cried out, verse 10, to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord, and we have served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies that we may serve you. Even though they had a history of not meaning what they were praying. Does that make sense? Like, they met, like Lord, we, we made a mistake. We promised we're never going to do it again. Please help us. And God shows up through all of these people in the Old Testament, and he helps them. And what does Israel do in return? Thanks, Lord. I got this from here on out. And they begin to make the same mistakes over and over and over again. Because does anybody relate? Anybody ever find yourself in a bind in life? Back against the wall, cornered, and you have no choice but to say, oh, God, I need your help. And if they, has anybody in that moment say, oh, God, I need your help, and I'm going to bank on everything that that little brown pastor told me at the church. I'm going to bank on the fact that you are faithful, and you're gracious, and you're kind, and you won't forsake me. So, God, if you help me this time, so help me, God, I will be better next time. You pray that prayer? How many of you prayed that prayer more than once? On more than one occasion? And if you've prayed that prayer more than once on more than one occasion, that means this. You may have more in common with these Israelites than you first thought. See, he's recounting to them all that the Lord has done. And the Lord, verse 11, sent Jeroboam and Barak and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hands of your enemies on every side. And you lived in safety. Samuel says, you remember your history. 
At every turn, no matter how disobedient you've been, no matter how much you lack devotion to the one who is completely devoted to you, he's been gracious and kind and he's raised up help for you. And yet, verse 12, when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. See, Samuel is like, hey, he's speaking the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And he's trying to get them to understand that God is the one that they should be trusting in, even though they had a habit of not trusting him. And even, if you will, rejecting God to his face, so to speak. Because despite how the Lord had protected them and provided for them, when enemies who would come against them, they would still panic. And, in, and take their eyes off of the Lord, look at their circumstances, and just do what everybody else was doing. One of the other things that we need to remember is when we make mistakes, we need to take time to reflect on and then remember God's faithfulness in our lives. Don't panic. Maybe it's more fair to say, in the midst of your panic, don't forget to take a deep breath. I'm just going to say it. Let's go. Can we go old school? In the midst of your panic, don't forget to take a deep breath, grab your Bible, open it up, and read about God's faithfulness. You could even read Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness is to how many generations? All of them. And at last I checked, according to the language, all still means, well, I was going to say you, but that's fine. Whenever we make a mistake, which brings about panic, we have to take time to remember how faithful God has been in our lives. And if you do that, what you'll remember is God has been faithful when you deserved it. Yes and amen? Now, some of you are like, well, I don't know if I ever deserve it. Well, look, you're here at church. You deserve a great day. We're going to give it to you. Right? He's been faithful when you deserve it. He's been faithful in the good days, the bad days, and even the ugly days. Would anybody testify to that? If we had a microphone and an opportunity to walk up on stage, how many of you all would say, <clears throat> I'm so-and-so, and I would like you to know that I can be a wretch sometimes, and yet God is still wonderful. Amen? Like, that's what the, that's what the message of the church is. So God has been faithful in all of that, and when we make mistakes, we need to take a deep breath in the midst of the panic and remember how faithful he's been at every turn in every part of our life. This morning, I was sitting, I tell you about Sunday mornings a lot because Sunday mornings for me start at four. So for me, it still feels like the past. <laughs> But I was sitting there, part of my process on Sunday morning is to put some worship music on and to walk through the passage again, to read through it and to pray, make adjustments and write down things that I feel like the Lord says, nope, scratch that, add this. If, if you weren't here last week, I encourage you to go watch that video. And then if you hate my guts afterwards, just come and talk to me personally, <laughs> right? So this morning, the worship music's on. And you know, my latest reality is I don't do this alone. Now I do it with the seven-week-old baby in my arms. It's just warm and fuzzy and wonderful. <laughs> Although today he, he spit up on, he like spit up, which is normal, yes. But he did so at the same time he was sneezing. <laughs> and like a good father, I was looking at him to make sure he was still breathing and okay. And I got spit up in my mouth. <laughs> Spittle hit the back of my throat. You know what I mean? And it, was <laughs> and it was at that moment that there was a song on the TV called Gratitude. And I lost it. Face covered and spit up holding a baby. Ezekiel, who has a tendency to get up at like 5.30 in the morning, I don't know why. <laughs> Sitting on the other part of the couch just to sleep. And I lost it. Because I, in the moment, I was overwhelmed by God's faithfulness in my life. 
I suggest to you that's not just my story. It's yours as well. Hopefully it doesn't involve seven-week-old spit up in your throat. But it's still yours. You have those stories. When we make mistakes, which brings upon a spiritual panic, we've got to take a deep breath, grab the Bible, and remember God's faithfulness. And when we do, it becomes helpful. Verse 13 so Samuel, in the midst of this challenge to the Israelites, says, And now, behold, the king who you, whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked, behold, the Lord has set him over you. In one sense, it's such a weird deal. Samuel says to them, God loves you enough to give you what you want, even though it's not what you need. But here you go. He gives them what they want. And he says this in verse 14, that if you will fear the Lord, serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord, your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Whenever we make mistakes, we should remember the call to be careful. To be careful. This is where the faithful people in our lives come in because God may actually use them to speak a word into our life. And that word may be overflowing with the, the necessity to be careful from here on out. You see, a lot of times when we make mistakes and we remember what it is that God has done and we have somebody to do that with in community, we come to a place where maybe in that moment we, we, are, we are at an end of ourselves. In other words, we give up and we can't do it on our own, so God, I'm going to trust you. We need people in our lives to say, let's be sure about this trust. Let's be serious about it. You know what I mean? We need people that are willing to say, hey, be careful then. Make sure that you don't forget about the disciplines of your devotion. Make sure that you are willing to fear the Lord. That's a hard word, isn't it? I don't know about you, but when I first became a Christian, this idea of fearing the Lord was terribly disturbing to me because I didn't understand it. And the reason I don't understand it is because I'm hearing it from a human perspective. I spent all of my eighth grade year being afraid of one person who punched me in the face early in the school year. And so for the rest of the year, I lived in fear of that person. That's human level fear. What's being talked about here by Samuel is saying, look, you've got to fear the Lord. It means to revere and respect above and beyond yourself and your circumstances. So whenever we make a mistake and we're confronted with it and we get a reminder of God's grace and his faithfulness, we have to hear the call to be careful. And being careful about not making those same mistakes starts with having a proper perspective on who God Almighty is. And notice I didn't just say a proper perspective on who God is, a proper perspective on who the Lord is. I said a proper perspective of who God Almighty, God the Almighty, commander of the angel armies, God who breathed out all that we see and know and don't even know about yet with a... <laughs> that's, my, that's, my, that's my best. <laughs> right? I know it was lacking, but when God did it, it did stuff. We have to remember who he is, and when we do that, we have to hear the call to be careful as it relates to moving forward, careful not to make the same mistakes. So we fear him, we serve him, we obey him, and we follow him. This is what Samuel called the people to do. Whenever we make mistakes, we must consider the call to be careful and return to the founda foundational disciplines of our discipleship. Which is interesting because today, small groups are starting up once again. It's another eight or nine week season here at the church. And for eight or nine weeks, we are going to re-engage the discipline or discipleship processes that we hold in high value here at the church. If you're not familiar with what that looks like or how that works, I highly recommend at the end of the service, find Pastor Dalton and ask him about small groups and the opportunity to re-engage discipleship with other people 
on a level that should be meaningful. Now, I want to give you an encouragement as it relates to this season small group study, which is about, it's all about all of our discipleship practices. For a lot of people, including the one lesson that we'll look at starting today, the first week's lesson, it will be review. And you may think to yourself, why are we taking time to do this? Is anybody wondering who it is that I'm... <laughs> why are we taking the time to do this? Because repetition and remembering is the key to understanding. And once we understand it, we'll actually live it out practically. And there is nothing wrong with good, godly, divine reminders. Yes and amen. So you embrace, we should embrace this small group study with all of our heart, mind, and soul. No matter if it's an old reminder or a new revelation, just engage and embrace it all. Because in so doing, we will find help as it relates to being careful as we move forward out of our mistakes and into more and more devotion. But here's what happens. This story is amazing. Because Samuel is just not letting him off the hook. He's made it clear, you've made a mistake. And here are the things that you need to remember. You need to listen to me. You need to remember what God has done. And you need to be careful. And in case you weren't paying attention, here's why you need to be careful. Because God himself is to be feared. Look at chapter 12, verse 16. Now therefore, stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. So Samuel, you have to, this is one of those moments where you have to visually, in your mind's eye, see the dramatic moment. There are literally hundreds, if not thousands of people standing before Samuel as he's calling his community back to covenant faithfulness. And in this moment where he says you have to be careful about how you move from here on out because God is supposed to be terrifying. So in this moment, he says to them, now therefore stand still. You pay attention. You watch what God's about to do. Is it not the wheat harvest today? This is a detail that a lot of times we'll just read right over. Is it not wheat harvest today, which gives a time stamp for you and I? If you do a little bit of research, you'll find out when Samuel was saying this to the people, it was about May, June. Does that seem fun to you? We planned it. <laughs> we didn't. It was about May, June. That's when the harvest would happen. And look at what he says. Here's an interesting thing. I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain. Which, by the way, when he says thunder and rain, he's using those, like, they're going to hear thunder and they're going to feel and see rain. Did you guys have that yesterday? We had the rain. We didn't have thunder. But snow in the mountains, are you, it's May. That's all I have to say about that. He goes, I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking for yourselves a king. Huh. So Samuel called upon the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Whenever we make a mistake, we should not be surprised if we have to suffer some consequences. And we should always remember that the consequences are not fair. But here's what I mean by that. <laughs> they're not fair, not that we deserve better, but they're not fair because we probably deserved worse. See, the people have been unfaithful to God, clearly. And Samuel wants to make sure that they're careful about moving forward in full devotion. So he says to them, he calls attention to the reality of how great, mighty, and powerful God is and how wicked their sin of asking for a king was. And God, at the time of the wheat harvest, thundered from heaven and poured upon them rain. That would have gotten their attention because, by the way, that's the dry season in Israel. I've been to Israel in May, and it's dry and hot, like 109 at 9 a.m., that's hot. Are you with me? But not only is it the dry season, it's also the wheat harvest, meaning this. On the bushels of wheat, on the wheat 
plants themselves would have been kernels that were ready to be harvested. Here's the bad thing. If they get rained on at that time, there is a great probability that they will mold and go bad quicker than they could be harvested. Ladies and gentlemen, I think one of the things that we have to remember when we make mistakes is those mistakes have consequences. And before we complain about what those consequences are, because God wiped out some crops, before we complain about what those consequences are, we should be grateful about what they were not. You see, we have in our positions before God himself, we have an intermediary named Jesus who stands in the gap, and though we suffer consequences practically, spiritually speaking, we do not have to worry like they would have in that day. You see, when we make a mistake, we have to recognize the consequences for our mistakes are real. And that's one of the things that we have to remember, right? Because we exist in a time where there's no consequences for anything. Do you guys remember... Like five minutes ago, I said the eighth grade was terrifying for me. Yes? It was terrifying for me because at the beginning of the year, a guy punched me in the face. I lived at a time when your actions came with consequences. You know why he punched me in the face? It's because I badmouthed him behind his back. We don't live in that time anymore. People can pull out their smartphone, their computer, their little devices, and say whatever they want without the fear of any kind of consequence. Just so you know, I'm working on putting a program on my phone that if you complain about me, I will know where you live. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to get some friends of mine to do it for me. And they will pay you a visit. No, I'm kidding. We're not even going to do that. However, there's a part of all of us who long for a time when actions actually have consequences. We made one of the biggest mistakes in our parenting history recently for Ezekiel's fifth birthday. We bought him a Nintendo Switch. Oh, listen, just stop with your judgment. Ooh. It has been an ongoing drama, this Nintendo Switch. Hey, bud. Time's up. No! I will admit freely to all of you that we, I, <clears throat> more me than her. I mean, he's a little miracle guy. It's a miracle baby. Didn't think we'd have him. Now we got two. I am spoiling the snot out of them. My older kids are appalled by the life that these two little kids live. Not appalled like they're angry with me. They're appalled like, uh, we love it, but you're going to pay. <laughs> and so every time that his switch time is up, <laughs> literally, and I'm going to use this word carefully, all hell breaks loose in our home. Nothing helps except consequences. Okay. Go to your room. Ah! Okay. You can't play it anymore all day. Ah! All week. Ah! One more, and we're selling it. <laughs> it's called parenting, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> We've been encouraged by the elders to think about doing a parenting class in the summer. There it is. While we understand how appropriate that is for a five-year-old, we struggle with it when it comes to being 50, don't we? He doesn't understand that the consequences could be much worse. I could take that switch, throw it against the wall, break it, stomp on it, throw it in the garbage right in front of his face, and be right in doing so. Might be a little harsh, but I wouldn't be wrong. Are you with me? But instead, what do we do as parents? Well, I would hope that we do exactly what God has done with us. We try to bring him along graciously. But not compromising the reality that there are consequences for our actions. And as it relates to our relationship with God through Christ, 
those consequences, no matter how bad they are and how much we want to complain about them, when we suffer them, they're not fair. They're not fair because we most likely didn't deserve better. We deserved worse. And yet God in his great love for us is just trying to get our attention. Amen? We're almost done. And to that you would say, amen? And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. Right? They're terrified. Do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord. Serve the Lord with all of your heart, and do not turn aside after, everything, after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. The last warning the Israelites get, one of the last encouragements, is that they should love God just like he's loved them. When we make mistakes, we must not allow them to stop us from loving the Lord just like he has loved us. And in the midst of those mistakes, we should avoid making even more mistakes by turning to something that cannot love us like God does. Not only turning to something, but maybe even someone. Only God gets to love us perfectly. And we've got to love him back. Finally, Samuel closes with verse 25. He says this, verses 24 through 25, only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all of your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But, here's the warning, if you still, still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. It's a caution to Israel to be faithful. God's people needed to be reminded that any kind of wickedness could have devastate, the devastating effect of leading them away from him. And whenever we make mistakes, we must remember to repent before our wickedness has a chance to destroy our discipleship. Again, not a popular thing to say in today's day and age. When we make mistakes, after all of these things, we should be quick to repent. We should be quick to turn away from those mistakes, turn to God, know that he loves us, experience his grace, and we should be quick to do that before our wickedness takes us down a path that destroys one fabric at a time, every bit of faith that we have.